Ms. Marski, uh, she, she uh, has marginal health at best. So I appreciate if you would keep praying for her. We need our piano player because you're stuck with me otherwise. <laughs> okay, please stand and turn your hymnal number 185. We'll do one song, My Savior's Love. Number 185. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own grief, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. Twill be my joy through the ages, through of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Amen. And then you can be seated. I've, I've, uh, it's been difficult, odd for me to get used to these abbreviated services sometimes, but I know with uh, the approaching, well, not approaching, it's here, with the weather that we have here, and um, I think it would be good to kind of start uh, trying to not shave the services in any way, shape, or form necessarily just for time's sake, but to be able to get people home as the weather gets worse and, and different things like that. I always want to be courteous and um, uh, let you know that I'm thinking of you and, and your journey home and uh, everything that goes with it. But uh, I like the songs that we sing. I like uh, that one right there, When With the Ransom and Glory, His Face I At Last Shall See. I love that. Um, but, uh, oh, my bulletin. I have it right here, I believe. Give you a couple of announcements. Uh, my brother's keeper, uh, donations are being set up for Christmas uh, boxes. We will be taking to the homeless and to women's shelters this year. Scarves and gloves, hats, coats, hand warmers, sleeping bags, and et cetera. Please see Miss Addie Jackson for more information. And then Secret Pals, there was a little bit of a mix-up. Um, the November Secret Pal is Miss Cindy Jewell, not Miss Sarah Hoffman. If you need her Secret Pal information, Please see Miss Hera, Miss Hera Hoffman, Miss Sarah Hoffman. Uh, please see her. And then CD series. Um, if you uh, would like a copy of uh, all the kinds of different series that we've uh, put together and, and we've we found and, and collected over the years, see Brother Dan. He can put. Um, he can give you individual um, cassettes if you want it or a CD. Um, uh, and, and the series, uh, the whole series that goes along with it. So if you'd like something like that, please see him. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, November 20th, uh, next Sunday, the Youth Thanksgiving presentation. What is that? What's the Youth Thanksgiving presentation? What are you guys doing? Um, we're going to say a poem. A poem, verses. some verses, and sing a song. Okay. Uh, November, tw no, in reenactment, uh, the pilgrims and the Indians getting together and, no? Okay. Okay, very good. November 22nd through the 25th, Academy Thanksgiving break. And then November 27th, junior and youth uh, activity to the Festival of Trees. Mm, let's see. Uh, if you, you led somebody to the Lord, please record it. Uh, if your name's not up there, I believe it should be. But if your name is not up there as a, on the soul winning sheet, 
uh, ask Miss Sarah to add it. We would like to keep track, keep record of these things. So if you do win somebody to the Lord, uh, also tracks, I don't know if you noticed, uh, but tracks distributed. Miss Sarah, that's the kind of account that we're trying to um, uh, keep a tally of is tracks distributed. And uh, if you just fill out year to date, if you just have an estimate, put it in there next to your name so we, um, we can keep record of that. Uh, I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in your King James Bible, amen. Uh, uh, Houston brought me a Bible this morning and said, Dad, this isn't a King James. I said, well, what are you doing with it? <laughs> I think it was one of the ones that just we found in the garage or something. It was a revised standard version. Um, and uh, uh, there's a lot of different a lot of different things taken out of a different, a lot of different uh, versions, so to speak, of the Bible. But uh, I'm not going to rant on that tonight. Just open your King James Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 11 through 15. Beginning in verse 11, the Bible says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, Hey, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and by and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, uh, the day that is speaking of in this verse, the day shall declare it. That's the judgment seat of Christ because he's speaking to believers here. Uh, if any man's work abide, uh, abide, which he hath built thereon, uh, thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you would help us uh, from this moment on, from this day forward, this hour forward, uh, to dedicate our works and dedicate our lives uh, to that moment where we will find ourselves standing at the judgment seat of Christ. One day just as real uh, as this room is that we, that we are in at this moment just as real uh, as the voice that I'm using now that people hear, there will be sounds and voices and uh, actions happening right in front of us, a day where we will spend at the judgment seat of Christ. Heavenly Father, help us to keep that in mind as we live this life. Um, Lord, I'd ask that you'd help us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to read another verse to you in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14, uh, verse number 13, it says here, uh, And I heard a, a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Their works do follow them. Now, he's not referencing uh, unsaved people. He's referencing saved people. Uh, uh, saved people, your works follow you. Your works will follow you. This is what this is all about. Now, I want to speak to you tonight about um, motives, motives and obedience. Motives or works. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite settled on a title necessarily, but motives versus works, motives versus obedience. Um, but you could say motives and obedience. Now, the nearest thing, I think it was Brother... Um, John R. Rice, who said this, uh, I believe he's the, the earliest one I've, I, I've heard saying this, and Brother Hiles always quoted it, and Brother Gray quoted it, and I, and I quote those guys. Uh, the nearest thing to the heart of God is keeping sinners out of hell. The nearest thing to the heart of God is keeping sinners out of hell. Now, that's the whole reason why he sent his son, was to keep people out of hell. The Bible teaches that uh, there is rejoicing in heaven, right, over one sinner that repents. Now, take, just think about that for a moment. God and the angel, in the presence of the angels, God and uh, the angels, and um, uh, uh, I believe if the, uh, the, 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 uh, the dead in Christ who, who are in heaven now, I think if they see it, and they, I think there's rejoicing in heaven over people who get saved. The Bible says uh, that, that they rejoice. Uh, in, in Luke chapter 15, he says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, 
God's plan for getting the good news, and that's just that's the gospel, the good news, getting uh, the getting salvation, the good news of salvation to a lost and dying world is personal soul winning. That is the divine plan: personal soul winning, and number two, letting your light shine. Right, living your te- living out your testimony. Um, now, some folks, some uh, some churches, or some uh, maybe uh, mistaught, or just folks who are missing the mark by a little, think that salvation is just. If I live a good life and I be a good person and let let my salvation show out, that will lead others to Christ. In in theory and and in teaching, yes. Um, However, you have to be prepared to give every man an answer that asketh of the hope that lieth in you. You've got to be able to back up what it is that you're living. But the best and most effective way to reach and die in world is going out and the Bible says preaching and teaching the gospel. The word preach. You know what the word preach means? The word preach means just basically proclaiming truth. That's all preaching is. Preach is, is teaching with, hey angel, is um, uh, uh, teaching with, with passion. Uh, that's what preaching is. Preaching means to proclaim. We are to preach it, to go and to, to tell others. And that's the, uh, I think that's God's plan for getting salvation uh, uh, um, from his word into the heart of the believer to the ears in the hearts of unbelievers. And he said unto them, go into the world. He did not say show into the world, right? He didn't say that. He said, go into the world and teach or and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark's chap- Mark chapter 16, verse number 15. Matthew 28, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. There it is again, go and teach not go and show, not show and teach. Go and teach all, uh, uh, therefore, uh, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, we face a lot of um, um, uh, issues, or I, I guess you could say many critical biblical uh, issues that are confusing. And a lot of people kind of get lost on or they get uh, uh, tied up or upside down on. And they have a a negative effect on personal soul winning. Uh, uh, One of these issues uh, that I want to pick on tonight is motives. A lot of Christians, they have good motives, good motives. Or they say, um, uh, my heart was in the right place. Okay, that's all well and good. But I want to dive into some Bible teaching tonight. Um, and, and look at a couple of things. I'll give you all that I can. I think this will be a two-part uh, a series, Brother Alex and Brother Dan. Tonight is obviously part one. Uh, next week will be part four, and then we'll go to part two, and then depart. <laughs> we won't do that. Uh, now, the Bible teaches four judgments. Four, I used to think there were just two judgments, the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. There are four judgments. Now, the four judgments mankind will face is number one, of, number one is already done. Uh, the first judgment is the judgment of Calvary, the judgment of Calvary. Now, the judgment of Calvary is where sin was judged. Sin was judged on the cross. It was taken care of. Christ who the Bible says committed no sin, amen. He bore our sins in his own body and sin was judged at Calvary. Sin was judged at Calvary. Sin is uh, uh, what Jesus had to endure, or not, the cross is what Jesus had to endure even so much that Jesus, that God Almighty turned his back and could not look at Jesus. Why? Why did he turn his back on Jesus? Because I think in that moment of time, God saw Jesus bearing all of our sins as he hung on that cross. This is the judgment of Calvary. Sin has been taken care of. The second judgment is uh, uh, the one we'll speak about uh, uh, tonight, but that's the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is not where sins are judged. Get that. When I was a kid, I used to think that... um, uh, be, until I was able to grasp the truths, not saying that I never heard preachers preach on it, but from what I understood and from kind of the bits and pieces that I grasped, I grew up thinking, man, the judgment seat of Christ, I'm going to stand before God, <laughs> and he's going he's gonna to pull down this screen. Here we go. I know I don't need this. 
because we have good mics up here, but he, God's going to, here I am, I'm standing front and center, and there are the masses of Christians behind us, right? And God's going to say, okay, Mr. Jackson, <laughs> you're born in September 20th, 1987. When you were three, day, three days old, you did thus and so. Because, right, we were born into iniquity. In 1994, you did thus and so. In 1998, you did thus and so. In 1990, uh, 1999, you stole from Redding's penny, uh, uh, grocery store. In 1997, you went down to the 7-Eleven and you opened up 13 Sprites looking for the winning cap. Buy one, get one free, amen. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and uh, oh, let's see, 19, 1998, you threw a hammer and it sunk into your sister Sarah's head. In, 1990, in 2000, you said a cuss word. In 1990, okay, you get it? And I used to think, oh, no, I'm going to stand before God <laughs> and Brother Kevin's going to see all the things that I did. <laughs> and Brother Boaz is going to see it. Miss Harrington's going to see all the things that I did, you know. And you thought the same thing. And I used to think, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. I'm, I'm going to put this back up. I, uh, God's going to put my sins up on the big screen, and everybody's, everybody's going to see them. Whew, thanks goodness that's not what the Bible teaches. Amen. The Bible does not teach that whatsoever. My sins were taken care of at Calvary. What the Bible teaches is that at the judgment seat of Christ, all the saved will be judged for their works. Now here, now the Bible gives us a description and an idea of what these works are and, and what's good and what's wrong or what will remain and what will, uh, what will be burned up. A lot of folks have uh, uh, an idea as a, that, that, that as a Christian, God was going to do a replay of my life. Thank goodness, thank you God that he's not going to do that. Um, uh, and I think all of us can take some relief in knowing that my life isn't going to be put on the big screen because boy, oh boy, would I be ashamed. Um, uh, all the things that I've said, all the thoughts that I've thought, all the deeds that I've done, I'm so glad that those were paid for on the first judgment at Calvary. Now, the, 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 the big screen idea of the judgment's not true because our sins are gone. They're gone. Now, the third judgment is the judgment of the nations. Now, you say the judgment of the nations. What is that? I've never heard of the judgment. Anybody ever heard of the judgment of the nations? Yes, I knew you would have. The judgment of the nations. You say, Brother Jackson, what are the judgment of the nations? Now, uh, the judgment of the nations is, um, uh, I give it to you the best I can. There's going to there's gonna come a time when the nations of the world will be judged uh, basically on how they treated Israel. Do I have that right? Their relationship with Israel, how they, how, they, how they treated the nation of Israel. The judgment of the nations will determine, get this, determine which nations enter the millennium. Now, um, uh, this, I, I, I did not know that. That's something I had to do, I had to read up on when I came across that, the judgments of the Bible, and I came across the judgment of the nations. Now, it doesn't, I don't believe that wording particular is there, but the teaching is. I had to look it up. And basically, God, there are some nations that are going to be completely and utterly wiped out. They will not enter the millennium in, what, in any way, shape, or form. And it's how they treated Israel. Um, and then the fourth judgment is uh, the, the judgment to end all judgments, and that's called the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment, and that comes at the end of, of the millennium. And you say, what millennium? I mean the millennial reign of Christ. After Christ has ruled and reigned on the earth for a thousand years, the great white throne judgment comes. And this is when uh, everyone who has rejected Christ's payments for their sins will be judged. So somebody who, let's, let's say somebody uh, passes away today, uh, November 13th, 2022, and the rapture happens tomorrow. Okay. The whole, all of the, the, the rapture, the, the world falling apart, coming back together, the Antichrist, all of that, Christ comes back for the, the second time, the, or the third time, I should say. Not the, not the let me see, the, let me see, how is it worded? The revelation, oh, how is it worded? Basically, one of them is Christians see Christ. But when Jesus comes back to the beginning of the millennium to wipe out everybody, the Armageddon and all that, every eye will behold him. That is where all the world will see him. That guy who died today still be in hell, still in hell, still in hell, still in hell. Christ will reign for a thousand years 
still in hell. Still in hell. After the millennial reign, where Satan is loosed for another season, for a little season, and the Bible says he comes to deceive the nations again, but for the last time. There is no war, there is no sword, there is no, no bloodshed, no fight. The Bible says that God will speak the word and whew, they're wiped out. Now that, I can't, my mind can't really comprehend all of that. It's really neat to try to think about, but I trust in it, I have faith in it, I have hope in it. God will speak the word, boom, they're gone. Satan's locked up in chains of eternal damnation forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and that's all great in new heaven and new earth. But before the new heaven and the new earth are established, there's something called the great white throne judgment. That's where all the souls are brought up out of hell. And all the, 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 the nations and all the people who have forgot God. Now you say, well, what's my part in the great white throne judgment? Um, uh, thankfully, it has no judgment to be done for me that day. My judgment will be done according to, to um, uh, what has been written in God's law and, and me being saved and his promises. I won't be there on judgment day unless I'm there, I think, maybe as a witness. I may be there as a witness because Brother Alex and I have went out soul winning or Brother Lucas and I or, or Houston and, or, or, uh, or whatever the case. And I've said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm Pastor Jake from Three Rivers Baptist Church. And, um, you know, can I give you an invitation to my church? And that guy went <laughs> and threw it down. And he'll say, let me call. Can I call your attention, Mr. Um, Jones and, and Mr. Jackson? Hey, uh, uh, Gabriel or Michael or whoever, you know, um, Claude, you know, Fred, Angel Fred, go get Mr. Jackson for us. And they go and they retrieve me. I don't know how it'll work. And I'll come and I'll stand and he'll say, Mr. Jackson, were you going so on in Brother Smith or Brother uh, Williams on such and such a day? And of course, I'll have a perfect memory. And I'll say, uh, yes, Heavenly Father, uh, we did that. And did you knock on um, D. Wald Street? And I'll say, yes, sir, we did that. And he say, did you talk to Mr. Jones? I'll say, yes, sir. Yes, sir, we did approach Mr. Jones. And we, we, we attempted to invite him to church. And he'll say, did he crumple up that track and throw it on the ground? And he'll Yes, Heavenly Father, he, he did. And he'll, he'll probably, oh, no, I blankety blank and didn't. No, I didn't. You're lying. You lie. I didn't because he'll, he'll know what the consequences are at that point. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. He'll say, hit it. And they'll pull down. I'm not, I'm, I'm hypothesizing here. Uh, maybe they pull down a screen. Maybe they're, they, I don't know. If, I don't know. There's some sort of projector or hologram, I don't know, and it'll show that guy taking that track and crumbling it up and throwing it on the ground or turning his back on us and not even giving us a Holy Spirit grunt and turning away and walking away from us. That guy is going to remember that. That's the great white throne judgment. Thank goodness whew, that, I, that I, I don't have to go through that. What a scary, scary time. Now, the Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, or excuse me, 3, 13 through 15, um, uh, I want you to pay attention to these works, or to these works, to these words. Every man, verse 13, every man's work, okay? Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort. Get that, work and sort. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, in this passage of Scripture is written um, uh, to save people. Get that again. He's talking to save people. Uh, so being that, that that's the case, whatever God says in this passage of Scripture, he's saying it to Christians, and since I'm a Christian, I should probably be paying attention to what he's saying. Right? Right? Hey, 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 look here. I should probably be paying attention to the scripture. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Then you should pay attention. Are you a Christian? Then pay attention. Now, now, notice the words uh, that uh, I, I um, uh, 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 emboldened here, that I, um, uh, that I emphasized here, I mean. Uh, 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 the word work. The word work. Now, it doesn't mean the same word. It doesn't mean motive. Work and motive, it's not the same translation. It's not the same word as motive. God didn't say he'd judge your motives. He said he'd judge your work. Now listen, the word motive, it doesn't appear anywhere in here. Every man's motive shall be manifest. It doesn't say that. Um, let's see. Uh, and the fire shall try every man's motive. 
It doesn't say that. Every man's motive of what sort it is. Folks, I can raise my hand and usually say my motives are pretty good. I usually have pretty godly and righteous motives, but I don't always follow through on them. I don't, and neither do you. Now, you may more than I, and I may more than you, but I don't always follow through on my motives, and that that's, should be a motivating factor to work, is that my motives will not be judged, but my works will be judged. So I should let that fact motivate me to work instead of just let it motivate me to have good motives. Well, I, 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 I sent prayers, or, or I sent you good vibes. Hang that motive stuff. Let me see works. God says, "Let me uh, show me, show me uh, your works." Now, um, uh, uh, the word motive it does not appear anywhere in this verse, uh, but the word uh, the the word work appears four times. One, two, three, four. Uh, work, work, work. Now, I think it's pretty clear that the Bible is teaching um, uh, in these verses is every man's works, not every man's motives, are going to be tried or examined by fire. Now, um, uh, our works, the Bible says, will will, uh, be rewarded, not our motives. So we have to conclude that there are works, not motives, in the last, during this judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, that are going to be rewarded. God likes a pure heart. God likes a heart that wishes it could do more. But if if we aren't doing what we can do in our motives, have us doing more, wishing we could do more than we could do, then we have nothing in the hand whatsoever because your motives do nothing. Your motives do nothing unless they motivate you to do what you can do. You got that? You understand that? If you can, if all you can do is lift a five pound weight, but you wish you could lift a 50 pound weight, so, so wishing you could motivate or uh, 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 having the motives to, to, to struggle to pick up that 50 pound weight, but you neglect to pick up the five pound weight, it did you no good. Besides, maybe you walk away defeated, going, man, I, I didn't succeed. But you could have picked up the five pound weight. And if you'll pick up the five pound weight over and over and over again, you'll move up to a 10 pound weight. And from a 10 pound weight to a 25 pound weight. And from 25 pound to a 40 pound weight. And from that 40 to that 50, you'll eventually get to that 50 pound weight, but you've got to do what you can do. You understand that? Do what you can do. Don't without the motives of, well, I wish I could, I wish I could pastor a, a, a thousand person church. Well, you'll never do that if you don't pastor the 50 person church and do it well. And you'll never pastor the thousand per, or the 500 person church unless you pastor the 50 person church like you would pastor a 500 person church. The same kind of quality, the same kind of work ethic, the same kind of uh, importance, the same kind of effort being put into it. God judges our works. Our works will be tried, not our motives. Not our motives. Now, uh, uh, notice that other word. There's works, and then there's that other word, sort. Sort. Uh, I went over to my parents this afternoon, and um, uh, I was um, sorting the laundry. Sort my laundry. And my mom told me, she said, I'd never met anybody that folded their dirty laundry. I said, well, I didn't fold it. She's like, that looks folded to me. I'm like, yeah, well, don't touch my dirty laundry. I'll do my own laundry. Get your hands off it. Uh, Don't mess with my stuff because I don't want to be mad at you for losing one of my socks. You know what I mean? I I don't lose my socks. I don't lose that stuff. Uh, Anybody have the the laundry or the dryer or the dryer or washer that eats your socks? You just pull one out and where'd the other one go, you know? Um, uh, And I don't want to have to blame her for that. Now, the word sort in verse uh, 13, when God judges our work at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to judge it according to what sort it is. What sort of work is this? What sort of work? Now, um, I I did that this afternoon. I I got my work clothes and I got my t-shirts and I got my uh, essential laundry, you know, the ones that you you gotta wear, um, and I and I and I uh, uh, I sorted all that out, and I do my laundry the way I do it, and I, I always put the uh, the lights with lights, or delicates, or darks with darks, or whites with whites, you know, um, uh, and and try not to have a pink load come out of the laundry, you know, all your whites turn pink, you know, uh, but I I do all that. Now that's the type of sorting God's going to do with our works, and He's going to take our works and sort them. God will judge a Christian's works by sorting them. The Bible says by fire. He's going to sort our works by fire. He's going to take all of our works, all the works that we did, 
the business we built, the family we built, the ministry we built, uh, the, uh, the, the, the lifestyle we built, the, uh, 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 the character we built, the testimony we built, all these things that we built, all of our works of our life, and he's going to throw it into the fire. Now, what kind of fire? I don't know. It says a fire. And by its explanation, it says it's going to burn stuff up. Now, get this. Um, he's going to sort them by fire. Some works, the Bible says, are going to withstand the fire. Some of our works are going to come out of the fire. And then other works are going to be destroyed. Uh, they won't withstand the fire. They're going to be destroyed. And, and those works, the ones that are destroyed, will be unrewarded. Unrewarded. Now, how will God judge? How's he going to do it? The following verses, uh, ver uh, 2 Peter 3.10 and 2 Peter verse, uh, 3, uh, 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 chapter 3, verse 13, uh, they kind of give us a picture of what's going to happen at the judgment seat. Now, get this. Follow along carefully. Quit moping over football. Quit thinking about your trip to Georgia. Quit thinking about Legos or school. Quit thinking about work. Quit thinking about retirement, you lucky, lucky man. No, quit thinking about whatever it may be and listen to this because it, uh, retirement. Now listen, your, here's your works. Get this. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the, uh, uh, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt away with a fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Guess what's going to happen to the NFL Hall of Fame? <laughs> burned up. The Baseball Hall of Fame? <laughs> burned up. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio? <laughs> burned up. The Basketball Hall of Fame? <laughs> burned up. The Louvre, or the, is it the Louvre? Yeah, the Louvre, burned up. The art museums, burned up. The Mona Lisa, burned up. Burned up. All the Picasso stuff, looks like it was already burned up. No, burned up, <laughs> burned up. All the Roy, all those plaques that we have out there. Now listen, those plaques themselves will be burned up. But the plaques out there in our hallway, they represent wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. What do they represent? What, what are they all about? Student of the year, uh, a bus driver of the year, um, a soul winner of the year, uh, a servant's heart award, we call it the Dwayne White, White Award, and, and uh, most improved and all these different things, all these works that we did. The Bible says that they're going to be burned up. Man, your diplomas, all the stuff that you worked so hard for, they themselves will be burned up, but the works they produced have a chance of being rewarded. Now get this. Nevertheless, verse 13, 2 Peter chapter 3. Nevertheless, all this burn up, all this stuff. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So, kind of give us a little picture of how God's going to judge things. Um, uh, so, the wood, hay, stubble. That's going to be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. And the gold, silver, precious stones, they're all going to be tried by fire. But those things withstand the fire. Gold and silver and precious stole, uh, stones, they last for eternity. For eternity. First uh, Corinthians chapter 3. We've started in verse 11. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. That's saying Jesus Christ is the foundation. Now, if any man build upon this foundation... If any man builds something on Jesus Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Now, there are two groups of materials found here. Two groups. Uh, uh, the first one is gold, silver, and precious stones. The other is wood, hay, and stubble. That's a description of two sorts of works. Get that. Just as I sort my laundry, just as you sort your tools, just as you sort your, you know, whatever the inventory may be, or whatever the, the situation is being called for, you sort it. You, 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 you sort what's going on, and that's what God's doing. He's given us a description of the two sorts of works a Christian can do. At the judgment seat of Christ, a person's works will be, will be sorted to uh, decide what type of works they are. Now, I, like you, I want works that are going to last. I want works that are going to be rewarded, Works that, that had eternal meaning. Now, remember that God is talking to saved people. So he's talking to you and he's talking to me. He's talking to saved people. Jesus is the foundation of faith and the only foundation of salvation. You get that. You can't get saved by anybody else. Jesus is the foundation. He's the foundation of salvation and upon which we build our Christian lives. 
Um, uh, so, however, once a person is saved, it is possible to build the wrong sort of works on Jesus. The wrong sorts. A lot of these um, uh, uh, people, I think, get saved. Some of these people, they accept Christ, they get saved, but man, they get attached to the wrong kinds of church. And the church begins to teach this prosperity gospel and this um, name it and claim it kind of gospel. And what this person begins to live is, is they're, doing the, they're doing all these works with the right motives, but they're doing the wrong works. They're not doing the works of Scripture. They're not doing the works that Jesus Christ has sent us to do. Jesus did not send us to be rich unless it's rich in mercy and rich in patience. and rich. Now, there's nothing wrong with riches as long as we can use them for the glory of God, as long as we can be obedient with the wealth. Hey, if you become wealthy, if you fall into it from some uncle or you become an heir or, or, or whatever to somebody's estate, that doesn't make you some bad person. But be obedient with the things that you have. That's, that's what we're getting. That's kind of the, the point I'm trying to drive here is o- o- obedience. Obedience. Now, um, uh, what kind of works they are? What kind of works do you have? Ones that are going to be rewarded or ones that are going to be destroyed? Every saved person is building upon that foundation of Jesus Christ. Everybody is. You're building on Jesus, good, good or bad. Now, at the judgment seat of Christ, God's going to sort out what the Christian was building. God's going to let us know. You, you remember in school when you did your art project and the teachers came by and they were kind of like, what do you have there? What did you do there? What, what is this? Show me how this works. What is this about? I sort of feel like we're going to kind of be standing by the house that we built. God's going to come along and strike a match, put it to it. Now, of course, I'm just trying to spark some imagination. Here you are. Jesus has laid the foundation for our life. We got born again, and we begin to build on the foundation of Jesus. We begin to do something with our life, whatever works it was, whatever things that we did with our life, and we begin to build on this, and then we, we come to the judgment seat of Christ, and, and, and God kind of lights a match whoosh, and sets it on fire. He says, okay, let's watch it burn. Let's see what remains. Let's see, let's, let's see what's still standing after the fire has went out. What's left is what we will be rewarded on. What's left is, is, is uh, 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 the, the, the rewards we receive from the Lord. Now, I, I want rewards, and I want to make sure I'm building a good work. And I can tell you right now, there's going to be some works of Jake Jackson that, have been, that are going to be burned up. There's some works of Jake Jackson. There's been some wood, hay, stubble. I can't say that, uh, uh, that there's no wood or hay or stubble in my home. I can't say that. Uh, there, there is. I know that there is in the structure that is Jake Jackson. I, I know that there's going to be, but I, I sure want there to be more gold and silver and precious stone. I want to add to that. Now, I ask you, can fire burn gold? Well, it can melt it and we can reform it and whatnot. But, but, but can fire burn it up and consume it? No. What about silver? Can it consume it? No. Precious stones? No. It can't. It can't, but on the other hand, can fire burn wood? Yes, it can. The Bible says where there is no wood, the fire goeth out, amen? Uh, 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 can it burn wood? Yes, it can. Can it, can, can it burn hay? Absolutely. What about stubble? Yes, it absolutely can. So since then, uh, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the works that will be rewarded are those made of gold and silver and precious stones. The works, you say, Brother Jake, what are the works that are, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, I am going a, a, a bit fast on purpose because uh, uh, there's a point that I want to get to. Uh, the works that will not be rewarded are those of made of wood, hay, and stubble. Now, uh, there have been some uh, off-the-wall teachings about rewards, um, and I want to iron that out real quick. Uh, there are uh, all kinds of different folks, different teachers and preachers and denominations who say that our motives will be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, they teach that, um, uh, that we will give glory, uh, that, that we'll give God the glory for what we have done, and that uh, 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 that's how we'll be rewarded. But that's, that's not true. And it can't be, it can't, it can't be, it can't be true because it's not found in Scripture. That kind of teaching is not going to be um, uh, uh, taught here because I haven't found it yet about this motive type of lifestyle. Now, during these days and during these times that we live in, 
Um, uh, we all judge everybody else's motives. Oh, uh, they're in it for the money. They're in it for the fame. They're in it for the glory. We're in it. But uh, I think we've gotten to a point where uh, uh, we say, uh, we teach people, hey, go soul in for the right reason. Teach your class for the right reason. Tithe for the right reason. Sing for the right reason. And I've said things like that. And I've said them for the right reason. I've said them for the right reason, but what we need is a whole teaching here. And what I want to give you tonight, very quickly to the point, is uh, uh, the, the whole teaching. I want to come full circle on this. Uh, we got to forget the whole idea of read the Bible for the right reason. Um, uh, pray for the right reason. Um, uh, do what you were told for the right reason. Uh, uh, I want to just teach what the Bible teaches, and this is what the Bible teaches. O B E D I E N C E. Yes, sir. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe and to show that um, uh, you're, you, you've come full circle in Bible teaching. It's obedience. Folks, I've come to church more times than, than I can remember, not with a good attitude, in a bad mood, not knowing what I, and, and that was just when I was a preacher. I've come to church um, not being a preacher and, a, and, and backslidden is all get out, but I came to church, why? Because I was commanded to. I tithed when I did not want to tithe or could not afford to tithe, why? Because I was commanded to. I've shared gospel tracts and I've went out soul winning and I didn't do it with a good spirit all the time or a good attitude all the time, but I did it, why? Because I did it with, I was commanded to do it. I was told to do it, so I went to do it. I was supposed to do it. Some say you, 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 you get rewarded if you go soul winning and do it with a good attitude and give God the glory. Well, God gets the glory regardless. Uh, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that the only reason we go soul winning, um, uh, I don't know about you, and I don't know how long you've been soul winning necessarily, but I, there is no personal, for me, there's no personal glory in soul winning. I've been cussed at, I've been yelled at, I've been chased by dogs, I've been scared, I've been put in situations that have been kind of sketchy. There's no personal glory in soul winning for Jake Jackson, the man. It is God's glory. But did you know if I did find personal glory, and I didn't say I didn't find satisfaction in it, I didn't say I didn't find happiness in it, I said I didn't find glory. There's no glory in soul winning for me because I'm not telling people my gospel, I'm telling people his gospel. It's not about me, it's about him. I'm just a conduit. You understand that? I'm just a vessel through which the Holy Spirit is supposed to speak. There's no personal glory in soul winning for Jake Jackson, the man. But there is satisfaction, there is gratification in telling people about Jesus. Um, uh, 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 but he gets the glory. But even if I did find personal glory in soul winning, that's not a reason to not go soul winning. Even if I did find personal glory in tithing, that's not a reason not to tithe. Oh, well, you, you tithe with the wrong motive. <laughs> so, you're, spill, you're still supposed to obey. I've been told as a kid, Jake, go clean your room. You know, I didn't want to go clean my room. I cleaned my room with a rebellious spirit, but I still obeyed. I ate my vegetables with a, rebe with a rebellious spirit against mom and against dad. But I still obeyed. See, mom and dad, sometimes they don't care if you do it with a good attitude or not. They want you to do it with a good attitude. They want you to have a good spirit about it, be happy about it. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. With a smile. I'll be glad to. Whatever I can do to help. That's great. That's over and above. Folk, kid, I don't care if you do it with a good attitude or a bad attitude, with a smile or tears. Do it. Why? Because mom and dad want you, the authority wants you to obey. Drill instructors get in the, the recruit's face and they yell and holler and spit and cuss and say everything upside down, inside out and backwards. They say everything besides, you know, your mama's real name. And they give it to you and they give it to you hard. They give it to you real. They give it to you legit in your face. They don't care whether you do it with a smile on your face. Sir, yes, sir, I love boot camp. Or you do it like, man, this was a big mistake. You're going to do what the drill instructor said. You're going to do what the chain of authority said you're going to do. Do it with a smile, do it with a frown, but you're going to do it. Obey, soldier. And God requires the same out of his soldiers. Be, ye, be a good soldier for Christ. Stand firm for Christ. Do it with a good attitude. Do it with a bad, bad attitude, but do it. Do it. Amen. That's right. Thank you, Brother Alex. Do it. Obey. 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 Now, that's what we're supposed to do. 
Whether you do it for your own personal glory or for God's glory, we are commanded and commissioned to try to keep people out of hell. And it's a shame. It's a shame. Uh, Brother Alex, I don't know, and, and you stick around Christianity long, real Christianity long enough, Bible believing, soul winning, uh, 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 Christ honoring uh, churches long enough, you'll find out that there are critics who accuse soul winners of doing it for their own. Oh, you're just going soul winning for your own glory. You stinking clown. And you'll usually find that the critics of soul winning aren't soul winners. You find out people who diss on you obeying the Bible usually aren't obeying the Bible. 99.9% of the time, they're living in some sort of sin themselves. So if a man wants glory, there's plenty of ways to get it. But I'll tell you right now, soul winning's not the way. Soul winning is not the way to get your own glory. Now, let's say you, you get on fire for God and you turn into a soul winning machine and and. Everybody, man, bro, Lu, brother Lucas, and why don't you come up here and share your testimony? And man, you just, and it turns into a thing. And we start, our church gives out awards and certificates and send you, you know, buy new tires for your car and pay first month's tuition at college for you. And man, brother Lucas, he was a great soul winner. And man, you kind of, you like, you like the accolades. And you're just really good with people. And you can win all, you may, you just win all kinds of, God has blessed you and anointed you to be able to speak with people and, and win them to Christ. And you used to do it because it was commanded. And you used to do it because your daddy did it and your grandpa did it and brother Alex did it. And, and it was taught in church and it was taught in Sunday school. And, and, and you kind of, you went with it and you started doing it and you got real good at it. And then you kind of lost sight of why you were going soul winning. But you kept going soul winning. And you kept seeing people saved. But all of a sudden, it transferred from the glory of God to, I'm kind of good at this. I'm actually really good at this. And people at church, they pat me on the back, and I've got my name on some plaques up there. and I got these awards here. And you start walking with a little bit of hitch in your step and kind of looking like a peacock of soul winners, you know. And and, and you've got this really great voice, and, and you get the choicest of solos and Now, I'm not going to sit here and judge your heart, future Lucas. I'm not going to sit here and say you shouldn't do that. But you should stay obedient, whether you do it with a a, a puffed out chest or, or, or a humbled, bowed head. You should still stay obedient because God will exalt the humble and God will abase the prideful. Now, go soul winning and do it for the glory of God. But whatever you do, still go soul winning. Read your Bible. Pray. Be kind to people. Don't do it for your own glory. Do it for his glory, of course. But whether you lose sight of his glory or not, be obedient. Be obedient. And they're not being a hypocrite. Because being obedient through the phases of all the different emotions that we humans are tested and tried and tempted with, if you just stay obedient, there you'll always keep that focus on the light at the end of the tunnel. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. Now, Let me end with this, Uh, give you a comparison between motives and obedience. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver, right? A cheerful giver. Uh, uh, I can tell you that I was lukewarm in my giving today. There have been some weeks where I was happy to give. There were some weeks where I was reluctant to give. And then there are some weeks where I was like, I am neither hot nor cold. (laughs) God Will you spew this money back out of your mouth to me? <laughs> Which he didn't. He kept it. Uh, uh, and I say that, and, and of course, with, in, in all joking. Um, uh, but God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, I guess you could take that word. You could also say a confident giver. Because that giver knows where it's going, why it's being used, to whom it is going, for what the purpose of it is. But not only that, I'm giving cheerfully Because I've been commanded to give, and I know that God's going to put it all together the right way anyway. So I'm happy to give God my time, my talent, my treasure. Now, does that mean if you're not cheerful, then you shouldn't give what you're supposed to give? I'm not happy about it. Oh, then you get to hold on to it. Then everybody in church would be unhappy to give. (laughs) I don't want to give. Well, then I guess you can't give because you have to give it with a glad heart and a smile on your face. That is not true. God loves a cheerful giver, 
But God commands us, whether we're happy or cheerful or we're mad about it, give anyway. Give anyway, whether you, whether you want to or you're reluctant, give anyway. The Bible says that we're to bring all the tithes into the storehouse, laughing or frowning. It's what we're supposed to do. The most important aspect of our service for God is not the motive. It's not the motive. The most important aspect of our service for God is obedience. Can, can I get a show of hands of how many people um, uh, there have been times where you didn't want to come to church? Come on, raise your hands. Raise your hands. Amen. Put them down. Are there times that, okay, get this. Are there times where you didn't want to come to church and you didn't? No, I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I will raise mine. Because I was in somewhere in here. And I just, I just couldn't. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, it was m- more along the times, it was before, it was before um, God called me to preach. Uh, and it was before you all asked me to be the pastor. And it was many, it was one of the times where, uh, and I could probably count on my hand, hands and my toes, if I counted them twice. No, I, I have not missed that much. Uh, I, could prob- I could probably count. If God gave me a, a perfect memory, it wouldn't, it, I don't think it'd be double digits. Um, uh, to where I stayed home because I just couldn't. It was week after week after week after week where a, a, a teetering Jake Jackson was asked to, to preach and I did not want to preach. I was reluctant to preach. I didn't want it, and Dad was sick, and the only reason why I did it, here you go, this is a perfect example, the only reason why I preached in the stead of my father is because I love my father. I did not preach for God's glory. I did not preach for God's people. I did not preach because I thought God would bless me and use me. I didn't do that. I knew that the Jake Jackson was not qualified to preach. I hadn't been to seminary. I didn't go to Bible college to be a pastor. I'm not even really that great of a Christian. Now, granted, I'm not like living like a heathen, but I'm not really that good. There's got some, I got some things that I, I'm, I battle with. The only reason why I preached instead of my father in, my, in the place of my father was because I loved my dad and he was my hero and he needed my help. Now, should I have not preached? You know how many people have gotten saved through me preaching? And how many people have walked the aisles and how many people have been baptized and how many people walked out and said, man, Brother Jackson, that was a great, that really helped me today. I didn't do it with the right motive, but I did it because I was called upon. You know, God's calling upon us to work. What are your works? And I don't mean sweating and hammering and sawing. and no, I mean your works, the deeds done in our body. I have not always had the right motives But God blesses obedience. God blesses obedience. And coming from, and listen, I I love my dad. He's my hero. And um, uh, uh, even though he's long-winded at times, he's still my hero. And he said, um, uh, uh, Jake, he's like, I never, I wasn't a perfect pastor. I I wasn't even the most polished pastor. And it amazes me how people stuck around back in those days, like Mrs. Van Zulen and Mrs. Harrington and Brother Kevin, these and I mean polished, middle class, good, solid, blue collar people, and 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 he's got a white collar tonight. And 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 uh, uh, just they, and Pastor Jackson's up here, just rip, roaring, snorting, spitting, slobbering all over the Doctor and Mrs. Pohazi, and Brother Jackson's up here, just kind of tearing it all up. He's like, it blew my mind how people stayed. He said it had to be the Holy Spirit of God. He said because there's one thing that I tried to do, one thing. He said I tried to obey the Bible, hot and cold. Good, good emotion, bad emotion, sad, mad, glad, in between, despondent, depressed, happy, elated. I just tried to be obedient. I just, if it was time to make the donuts, or if it was time to make the donuts, I tried to be obedient. Now, uh, the judgment seat of Christ is the place for judging a Christian's obedience. So Christian, the judgment seat of Christ is for you and it's for judging your obedience to this book. The point of uh, the illustration that Jesus is giving is that obedience, not the motive, is the most important aspect. The person who gives for his own glory can still send, you give for your own glory, but you can still send people to the mission field, just like the guy who gives for God's glory. You see, that's where obedience is key. And you say, man, that's really smart. Yeah, because God knows the human heart. 
Because God knows that that guy over there, and the human, I should say, not just that guy, but human emotion goes like this many, many times. So God says, I'm going to give you this um, uh, the, a retaining wall against your emotion. So when you're happy and when you're sad, and when all, so when the waves of your emotion come crashing against this precept, against this statute, against this command, you have no excuse, Christian. Just be obedient. Just be obedient. Now, the question that, that uh, uh, will be asked at the Holy Spirit, or at the, at the Holy Spirit, uh, from the Lord on the judgment seat of Christ is, is I, I think it'll be this, I, I think it'll be something along these lines of, did you obey? Were you obedient? Now, I'm going to stand before the Lord and go, Lord, do you really have to ask that? I mean, you already know. <laughs> Lord, I tried. I, I think I was. I, I think I did. I, I had the right kind of heart, Lord. <laughs> He's going to say, no, the heart is deceitful. Above all things, amen. Uh, uh, but I, I wanted to, Lord. Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So if you're winning souls, you're obeying God. If you're tithing, you're obeying God. If you're loving your spouse, you're obeying God. If you're obeying your parents, you're loving God. If you're being a, a, a faithful, you're loving God. Now, at the judgment seat of Christ, it's not going to matter if you did it for God's glory or yours. I'll let God hash that out. It will only matter whether you obeyed or not. Did you obey? Did you obey? Because I promise you, if you live a life of obedience, God has a way of getting your heart tuned for his glory. If you live a life of obedience, you'll start, stop patting yourself on the back and you'll learn this thing called humility and going, it's not about me. It's about Christ. It's not me, it's Christ. And that, I know that seems pious and that seems, oh, that's holier than thou. No, it's the right kind of attitude. It's the right motive. It's about Christ. So it's, the Bible says it's obey. It's, uh, it's, it's a better to obey than to sacrifice. Now, it's, it, uh, uh, it's better to obey for the wrong reasons than not to obey at all. It's better to obey for the wrong reasons than not to obey at all. If I say, boys, clean your room or I'm, or I'm whooping you. What? Well, I don't want to get whoops, so I guess so. You know, you should clean your room because it's good to have a clean room. You should clean your room and hang up your clothes and put your stuff away because it's um, uh, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. I think only one people, know, one person knows that. And listen, I'm cluttered. I've got clutter. James got cluttered. We all have clutter. We're still technically moving in. Uh, <laughs> it's difficult. It's hard. And not everything's going to be that HGTV looking thing, you know. Um, uh, but if I say, hey, go do this. They're like, well, I guess I better clean up because I don't want whooped. I, I, I guess I better clean up because I don't want dad to get mad. I don't want mom to yell at me. Okay, that's the wrong reason to clean your room. But I'd rather you do it with the, I'd rather you have a clean room and clean it with the wrong reason and the wrong motive than not to clean it at all. Do you understand that? It's better to obey. It's better to obey for the wrong reasons than not to obey at all. The Christian who does not win souls to Christ who does not have a walk with God. And then they criticize the people who do win souls. And they criticize people who just seem to know a lot of Bible and uh, uh, the walking word of God and, and people who can quote scripture and people who try to live a holy life. The people that criticize those people will be judged for their disobedience. So don't get, don't, don't, um, uh, what does that say? The lions don't concern themselves with the opinions of sheep. Okay. Uh, 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 not saying you're a lion, not saying other people are sheep. But the Christian who's obedient to God doesn't have to concern themselves with the opinions of the disobedient. There, that's better. So pointing their finger and accusing someone else doesn't change their disobedience. Don't let them dissuade you. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, the Bible says that we are to do all to the glory of God. And that's true. The purest and the loftiest and the highest purpose for serving God is to do it for his glory. That's the reason we should do all that we do is do it for his glory. However, that's not the only reason to serve God. That's not the only reason to serve God. Um, uh, according to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29, the Bible, it, it says, if we serve God, we will get rest. If you serve God, you'll get rest. 
Preachers all over, yes, last week and the weeks before, this whole year, including today, they all stood up in their, in their, in, in their, in their, in their pulpits and on their platforms, all in their storefronts and in their beautiful buildings and everything in between, house churches, and they stood up and they preached to America. And they pointed their finger, not with self-righteousness, but with biblical authority, and they said, get saved or you're going to split hell wide open. Get hell or get, get hell. Get saved or split hell wide open. Don't you don't get hell. Get heaven. Amen. Uh, 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 get saved or, you, or you're going to split hell wide open. Not a one of them. Not a one of them stood up and said, "Get saved so you can glorify God." I don't think anybody stood up and said, "Hey, why don't you all get saved so you can give God glory?" Why don't you get saved? People that are unsaved are not really concerned with giving God glory. You know, when I sat here at the age of 13 or going on 14, I heard my dad get up and preach a hellfire and damnation, uh, uh, Chandler shaking, paint peeling, uh, a pew clinching, tear shedding uh, 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 message on hell. And I said, man, I don't want to go to hell. I want to make sure that I'm going to heaven when I die. Now you say, well, that's the wrong reason to get saved. You're supposed to get saved so you can give God glory. No, I got saved so I could give God glory. But I didn't get saved to give him the glory. I got saved so I didn't have to go to hell. The Bible says, and some saving with fire, or some saved with fear. And, 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 and uh, uh, Jude, some saving with fear. Well, God, God used Pastor Jackson to preach a message on hell, which got Jake Jackson a feared, amen. I got a scared and got scared and turned my life to Jesus and said, dear Jesus, will you save me? And he saved me. I didn't get saved because God was good. I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. And we say, well, that's a wrong reason. It was still obedient because God commands all men everywhere to be saved. God wasn't willing that I would die and go to hell. So I went, so I came forward and I told my dad, dad, I need to nail down my salvation. I didn't get saved to glorify God. I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. But I'll tell you this right now, I'm still saved. And I'm, I'm still on my way to heaven, and that's what counts. Obedience. As Jesus was to the cross, so was I. I was obedient to the cross, as Christ was. I came to Christ, and I said, Christ, would you save me? And he saved me. He didn't care what my motive was. I think the thief on the cross was terrified of dying. And I think as the, the hours went on and the time went on, as he hung on the cross... And he saw everything that had happened with Jesus and the sky turn and the earth shake and the people around him and all the things that happened. I think that, 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 um, that, that thief on the cross did an inward inventory, excuse me, an inward search and inventory. And he peered on the inside of himself and he said, self, he might be the Christ. And if he is the Christ and you die without his blessing, you're going to go to hell. I, 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 I think I might want to lean on this guy. What, what have I got to lose? I'm dying. The Roman soldiers are getting ready to come break my legs, and I'm going to suffocate and bleed out in excruciating pain. Hey, Lord, would you remember me when you come into paradise? Jesus looked at him and said, Today thou shalt be with Mary and Pyre. He didn't say, he didn't say what are your motives? All the thief did was obey the gospel and believe on Jesus. That's all it took for salvation. Our works are going to amount for something, whether your motives are good or not. So when the doors are open, show up. When the plate is passed, give up. When the church needs help, help out. When your brother or sister in Christ needs help, help out. Your works matter. Because if we be obedient to the Bible, in the last two weeks I've given away $200. I did not, I, I don't have, I don't, I'm not rolling in money. I'm not Scrooge McDuck where I can just kind of oh, give it away. But if I have excess and, and my, my belly's full and I have clothes to wear and my family's taken care of and my needs are met and my necessities are met and I have this excess, whether it be five bucks or a hundred bucks and uh, my brother is telling me about his woes in life and I go, let me help you out. The Bible told me if I'm able to help my brother and I don't help him, I'm not being obedient. That doesn't mean I go around giving away my riches and giving away of myself. Not my riches. I, 
I'm, I'm four letters short of riches, amen. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't have that. <laughs> Never heard that before. Uh, I'm about five letter, letters short of riches because um, Jamie keeps spending it on Amazon. Uh, not, not really, not really. Uh, uh, but I'm supposed to be obedient. Obedient to that book, good motives or not. Now, you gauge yourself. Say, am I being obedient? Am I, am I trying to obey those spiritual impulses? Folks, your works are, go- they're going to be. They're going to be tried. Your number will be called. Your life will be put on, not trial, but your works will be put to the fire. What's gonna last? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for your word and how true it is and how good it is and how right it is. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd help us this evening to try our life by your book, to examine our life by your book and say, man, not that I do I measure up because Lord, we don't measure up, but you have made it simple that we can obey, that we can obey. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you would help us to obey. Uh, Convict us when we disobey. Um, Lord, we don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. Lord, we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. But help us to be so tender-hearted to know when we do, to know when the Holy Spirit's speaking to us, to know when when we when we've disobeyed or we've grieved or we've done something wrong. Lord, I'd ask that you would uh, continue to be patient with Three Rivers Baptist Church and all the folks that go here as we continue to learn, continue to grow, continue to venture out. Lord, I'd ask that you'd lead the way for us. Lord, we know you know our hearts, you know our motives, whether right or wrong, good or bad. Uh, holier or unholy. But Lord, help us to be obedient in all that we do, in all that we say, all that we think. Help us to be obedient, to come under the authority of Scripture and then depend on you to reward and to bless and to dole out um, uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the actions that unfold from our works. Lord, we love you. Keep us safe this week and um, help good things to come our way this week. And, and when the bad things come, help us to handle them like Christians. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed. We'll see you back here Wednesday. And then again, of course, on Saturday and Sunday.